Hello, everyone who's joined us. Uh, we will start our, uh, our webinar here in just a couple minutes. Uh, we want to make sure that all of the participants who wanted to be with us today at noon are able to do that. So if you can just hang tight for a couple minutes, we'll get started. Um, and then we'll officially welcome all of you to this conversation from K Spiritual Life Center in a virtual space in many different locations around the world. Well, I welcome everyone who's a part of this conversation today. For all of you attendees, we're grateful that you are making um, time in your day to be a part of this conversation. K Spiritual Life Center sits at the heart of American University as a place of meaning, purpose, and community. In the midst of national and global tragedies um, and challenges, these the communities of K Spiritual Life Center have always gathered our diverse communities of belief together for conversations, reflections, and shared prayer. The current circumstances are no different, just the way we're doing it is a little altered. As the university made decisions with regard to in-person instruction in response to the COVID-19 outbreak, our various communities of belief had to pivot into different modes of gathering. I have been personally impressed with the creative and thoughtful conversation considerations of our various religious and spiritual leaders related to American University and their commitment to our broader American University community. K Spiritual Life Center, even in a virtual way, sits at the heart of the conversations about finding meaning and community as we live into these our current circumstances. Before we begin, I, begin, I want to introduce myself. I'm uh, Reverend Brian Oskvig, known as Rev O, um, the Interim University Chaplain for American University. I also want to name our reality. Given all of the current stay-at-home orders, I'm hosting this conversation from my home. Those joining me in this conversation are doing so from other places, one of whom is actually doing it from another country. I have four little ones in this house somewhere in some state of home education with my partner who is doing her very best to give us this time of quiet. That doesn't mean that my 10 through three year olds are going to honor this time of quiet. And I imagine that my partners in this conversation with pets, colleagues, co uh, and, uh, and others uh, who are in their homes may also be similarly interrupted. But that, I think, may be uh, the truth of where we are. We may be visited by a little one, we may run into technical issue issues, but I think that most honestly represents where we all are in our current circumstances. Now, today, I am joined by four other significant thinkers related to K Spiritual Life Center as we consider the first topic of a series of topics related to the current situation. I first want to introduce Reverend Blaine Young, um, who became the director of American University Chi Alpha in 2014. Completed an internship uh, with uh, AU Chi Alpha in 2011 and 12, and is a credentialed minister with the Assemblies of God Church. Uh, Blaine's main roles include preaching, teaching, mentoring, and counseling students, all while overseeing the ministry here in the DC area. He graduated from the University of Alabama, where he was a national Hispanic scholar and received a BA in religious studies and minored in computer science, technology, and applications. Uh, Blaine, so we understand that you're well-versed and prepared for our, our current uh, heavy reliance on technology to do our work. Grace uh, Hegarty is the Catholic Campus Ministry at AU. She fell in love with campus ministry during her undergraduate time at the University of Maryland, where she was very involved with the Catholic Student Center. She attained a Bachelor of Arts with a double major in English Language and Literature and Political Science. 
She has a history of working with federal government and other church ministries through the Catholic Archdiocese of Washington, which has brought her to be with us now at American University. We're also joined from England uh, with the Venerable Brahmachari Raj Vahari Sharan, um, who moved to Washington, D.C. from London, U.K., to serve as the first full-time director of Dharmic Life at Georgetown University in 2016, making him the first Hindu monk to serve at an American institution. He's also an adjunct professor in the Department of Theology and Linguistics. His academic training is in Indiology, Sanskrit, Philology, Classical Indian Intellectual Systems, Indian Religious Traditions and Society, Medieval Braj Literature, and Vedanta. He is an instructor of Hindu priests and holds the title of Vag Vachara, um, which means Master in Hindu Rituals. Brahmachari Ji has been serving as a consultant to the Hindu community of American University, guiding the preparation for a consecrated Dharmic space in the K Spiritual Life Center. Welcome, Brahmachari. And finally, Molly Feldman uh, joined AU Hillel's team in July of 2017 as an assistant director and senior Jewish educator. Molly received two master's degree from the Hornstein Jewish Professional Leadership Program at Brandeis University. Molly completed the Experiential Jewish Educators Program at um, Pardee's Institute in Jerusalem and received the Certificate in Experiential Jewish Education from Hebrew Union College. And I welcome all of you uh, to this conversation and I'm grateful for all of you taking the time and I'm grateful for all of our participants who are joining us online. We encourage you as we begin our questions, um, those of you who are joining us as attendees, that there's an opportunity to ask questions. We will review those questions as our conversation continues on and hope to get to some of, uh, as many of them as possible. Uh, you are also welcome to email us your questions at kslc at america.edu, american.edu, which is the email uh, website, uh, the email address for Case Virtual Life Center, and we will try to address those questions in that way. So, uh, my friends, uh, as we gather, our first question, really, uh, as we sort of move into this new space, is to start with, uh, how are community and community gatherings a central part of your religious or spiritual traditions understanding of themselves? And how did your community gather or stay connected prior to our current situation? And uh, Blaine, I'm going to go ahead and start with you and trying to answer that question. Yeah, thanks so much for having me on. There's this classic book that gets passed around Chi Alpha circles called Theology of the Community of God. And so for us as Christians and more particularly Protestants and Pentecostals, we draw this idea that community is deeply spiritual from the kind of crazy, mysterious idea that God is three in one, that he was community unto himself and invites us into that. So community becomes a big part of all we do. Prior to everything in the pandemic, um, we really prioritized relationships. If you're around our campus ministry a lot, you'd hear this phrase that transformation takes place along relationship lines. And so from one-on-one -on -one coffees with students, from peer mentoring, from upperclassmen mentoring um, freshmen, we try to have weekly or bi-weekly times of connection, table to table, shoulder to shoulder. And then we have services of worship that maybe look more like a church might uh, look off of campus. But for us, the, the bread and butter of what we do is our life groups and then our one-on-one -on -one discipleship and mentoring. Excellent. Uh, Molly, do you want to sort of answer that same question? Uh, how has your community understood itself as gathering, how they gathered themselves prior to where we are currently? Yeah, sure. sure. Thank you. So I think that in many ways, Jewish space and life is really structured through community, both in its uh, religious forms. There's aspects of prayer services um, that actually can't be done um, without a gathering of, of 10 or more individuals. Um, and other holidays, religious traditions, the um, you know Shabbat dinner or the Passover Seder, to name just a few, um, are really structurally built around the idea um, and the ritual of people gathering together. Um, and also want to name in that that uh, you know Judaism is not um, only a, a religion, or for many of our students, uh, religiosity or ritual practice doesn't compose the central part um, or even necessarily any part of their own sense of Jewish identity and life. Um, and for many of the students and uh, folks that we work with, that Jewish uh, cultural and social gathering um, in community is really the, the way that they connect to their Jewish identity, their Jewish selves, uh, and build, build a sense of sort of peoplehood around, around Jewish communal spaces. 
Um, and on campus, we uh, try to try to meet those needs in a lot of ways. We have um, a number of uh, learning fellowships on different topics that students participate in. We also have a number of student groups that organize events connected to different social or cultural activities. Um, and we also uh, on campus would offer weekly Shabbat services and um, dinner as well as holiday programming services, meals, um, activities, things like that. Um, so definitely the disruption to gathering in, in physical space together uh, is causing us to sort of rethink and reframe some of the ways that we um, try to continue to allow these access points to social, cultural, and, and religious connections to, to Jewish life. Thank you so much. Uh uh, Brahmachari ji, uh, same sort of question. How has your religious community, religious spiritual community understood itself uh, in gathering as community? And then how was that practiced prior to the current uh, situation? Yeah, this was a, a question that plagued many of us, especially spiritual leaders, because how do you encourage people who are taught that the spiritual quest is an individual one? How do you encourage people who have that very strong sense of individual journey, pace, um, even worldviews uh, to come together in community. And the way that they did this in, ancient, in, uh, in the ancient times was by the realization that actually we're seekers, not believers. Um, and that dichotomy is very, very important. We seek out answers for questions and we do so by asking people. And you can only ask people if uh, those people are thinking about the same questions as you are. And in that way, you form a community uh, through questions, through answers, and then uh, a lot of what Blaine was saying was, uh, holds true. It comes uh, through how you, your interpersonal relations develop. Um, but knowing that they are developing around the question of how do we get ourselves out of our, uh, how do we get ourselves out of suffering, as opposed to how we please God, those uh, those questions are more central to our um, our communities and. That might look a little bit different from how Hindus uh, uh, practice their traditions now, and that is attributed to the past two or three hundred years when we've been living under a very Protestant um, mindset. That kind of uh, Protestantism is now reflected in Hinduism, whereas before we never had a uh, use for temples as gathering spaces. Suddenly we're in temples on a Sunday um, doing everything that a good Christian would do in the Victorian times in 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 India. So. Using the best of both of those things, we're trying to encourage people to continue asking those kinds of questions that would bring them to a place like this, the online uh, seekers forum, if I dare say. Thank you so much. Uh, Grace, uh, the same question to you uh, with regard to the Catholic community and the way they've understood themselves. Yeah, so one of the things about us at AU Catholic is that hospitality is so important. Um, so many people are raised Catholic and, you know, maybe go to maybe go to mass like here and there, maybe come to some of our events here or there aren't really involved. But one of the things that we always do is we always make it a point to have either a staff member or a more senior student to go out and to reach out to those people and just have a conversation with them, ask their name, remember their name, get coffee with them. And then through that, then we we funnel our students. Um, through you know sort of like our, our progression of of formation of community and community is just such this essential element of everything that we do like blaine said you know we're a religion based in a communion of, of of three persons and so we're meant for communion as well and it's just this important element of of our ministry i mean even to the point where we have some girls who live together and they have formed households and now they're doing you know household meetings on zoom <laughs> um but you know so so how we gathered together was obviously through our liturgy and liturgy means work of the people and so of course we we find it really really hard that we can't do our liturgy anymore that we can't worship god in that way in the same way you know we can live stream mass everything but you know the hospitality element is was something that that we really we really loved and um and then we would you know funnel people into more like bigger meetings with you know maybe a formation talk but also dinner and then a nice small group discussion and then we also had one-on-one -on -one mentoring as well so that way there was an element of feeling like a part of the larger community in the liturgy and then even in like other side things but then also we had um that one-on-one -on -one element too or you 
we had the bigger community and then we had our little smaller community with like some small groups and then we had the one-on-one -on -one. so it was these like different levels of of walking with someone that um yeah that we were doing before this all based in that element of hospitality of welcoming everyone that that came so grace just continuing with you um uh, what ways are you bringing your community together now in sort of the the current sort of realities and staying connected with the members of your community sort of what are the what are the things you're doing you mentioned um you have a group of women who are connecting through zoom like what other things are you um in the catholic community doing to sort of remain connected to your to your um to all of those involved with the community yeah so i mentioned a couple of things but what we've been doing is is we've been doing we got a zoom account and so with zoom it's really great because you can have like a big person meeting but then divide it up into small groups so we've we have these two big you know things that we do each week and it consists of one big talk but then smaller group discussions that are more intimate and so we've been able to do those on zoom at the exact same time the exact same day that we were doing it before which has been huge and then, like I said, with the mentor meetings, we've been able to do all of our mentor meetings on Zoom as well, which has also been huge because we've been able to keep up this element of walking with someone in their faith, in where they are. Um, so we've been doing those two. Um, then with the households, so we do have a households program and the girls who were living together, who obviously are no longer living together because they're all at their parents' house, the girls who were living together, they would have um, weekly meetings where they would come together as a household and either you know, maybe it was chill um, or maybe it was a little more structured and there was some formation involved, some education, um, or maybe they prayed together. And so with the households, they can meet on Zoom and they can do that now too. And the girls who have been doing it on Zoom have said that it was really, really good for them because they missed having that like that faith community because sometimes when they're at home, it's not necessarily the same thing. And so they missed having that that community and that structure and that support in their daily life. And so kind of helping them do that one of the other things that we've been doing is we've been live streaming our liturgies. And so um, for us as Catholics, all of the priests still offer the mass every day. And so we've just been filming the priests offering mass in their own in their own home. And um, we've been live streaming it and putting it up online. So that way people can can pray with it live in the moment. It's not pre-recorded, although people could watch it later. That's it saves. That's an option. But if they want to do it live, then you know we've been inviting them to that, encouraging them to do that. And with that, one of the things is that we've also been encouraging our students to develop a structure and a schedule during this time. And so really being intentional about the time, because if you're not intentional, it could waste away like a lazy Saturday afternoon. And so we've been encouraging them to you know wake up at the time that you say you're gonna wake up, study when you say you're gonna study, go to the live stream mass, you know, do your meetings um pray you know you have no excuse not to pray anymore <laughs> and so we, we've been really like encouraging them to to be structured with their schedule but then to also be intentional about who they are speaking to being intentional with their family members that they are living with you know having an evening of no technology maybe they play a board game with their family or maybe they read a book um so we've been really walking with them and encouraging them through things like this through zoom through webinars all that so Molly, uh, thank you very much, Grace. Uh, Molly, I've been impressed uh, with all of you. Uh, Molly, I've been impressed with the way the Jewish community has also been sort of remaining connected. Uh, will you speak a little bit about what y'all are, uh, what you all have been doing? Yeah, so I think there's two sort of main branches of the approach we've been trying to take. Um, the first is really the continuing of one-on-one -on -one engagement. Um, checking in, having one-on-one -on -one conversations, the relationship building that would be the core of our work on campus is still the core of the work that we're doing remotely now. I think uh, that social and relationship connection is perhaps even more important in a time of social distancing. So both from our staff side and our student side, because uh, we do have some as student interns who on campus would be meeting with individuals in the community, um, we're all still trying to continue that work, even though it looks a little bit of a different way. Um, and that happens through the direct outreach that staff or student interns are doing. We've also um, created a virtual coffee date sign up form that just anybody can fill out. And we've had a number of folks connect with us through that. Um, just thinking, you know, any barrier, if it feels even just a little harder to choose a particular person to reach out and email, there's just sort of this form, you can submit it, we'll reach out to you. 
Um, so that connection has been has been a really important piece of it. Um, and then we've really been trying to focus on contact before content. And what I mean by that is, you know, on campus we might be having uh, events, programs where we would have a high standard for ourselves and for our students of like what is the content of this program, both because we want to do good work and also students on campus have so many things competing for their time that if the content of our program isn't really high, we're probably going to lose them to other opportunities. The reality that we're living in right now is that I think any gathering that we have is so much more about the contact between people that um, community, just a space to be able to check in, to maybe have a structured conversation or just catch up and shoot the breeze and like talk about what's going on in a real way. Um, so we've been trying to offer virtual gathering spaces that um, I would, you know, say sort of fall loosely in the structure of events, but we're really trying to create it as a space for people to come together um, and we're not trying to stress for ourselves or for the students who are planning them to really develop a lot of content because we think that what students need right now is, you know, more, more minimal on the content side and more emphasis and uh, support and love put into the contact and, and the personal relationship. Thank you so much. Uh, Blaine, where, how has Chi Alpha stay connected and what, what all are you doing? Yeah, and I appreciated Molly kind of extrapolating on this idea we've been trying to navigate as a team is this tension between content creation and consumption and then personal connection. And so for us, like many things, we think it's a both and not an either or, uh, like Molly was talking about, but what is the current need of the student? And we found initially uh, from, from spring break week one to uh, the next week, we found that um, people did want to continue to get content from us um, at their regularly scheduled times of the in real life happenings. So whether that was uh, meetings for our student leaders, whether that was sermons and some type of expression of worship with our larger community, um, they wanted that kind of regularity. I think as more and more Zoom accounts opened, we discovered that they wanted less things ported over from in real life to digital in the same format. And so it brought us to this discussion of how does the, the method impact the message itself? And so for us, what we're doing is continuing in our every other week one-on-one -on -one mentoring we call discipling. So our staff do that with our student leaders, about six staff with um, 12 student leaders. And our 12 student leaders do that with about 50 people that are in the community, students who are members um, of all that we're doing. Um, so we're continuing to do that. Um, and then we're also um, trying to keep, um, keep engaging in the celebration um, and the discipline of celebration. So as we think through commencement exercises and as we think through kind of milestone markers, we want to kind of step in where there's a need or a gap and kind of begin to highlight students' achievements and endeavors where things that normally would celebrate them, those mechanisms aren't available. And one of the extensions of that is two of our staff are running a senior uh, support group. It's a grief group for our seniors um, that meets for three or four weeks and they're really just processing and being honest with their emotions about what's going on, how do I respond, and then what's my view of God in all this? And so in some ways, we do have virtual versions of our life group and our Thursday nights and one-on-one -on -one coffee, but we're also kind of trying to ask that missional question of where's the need and is there anything we can do to fill it? And so I think we're still discovering that, but it was interesting for us around week two how it shifted dramatically in terms of what students wanted and then how often they wanted to engage uh, in the Zoom call. So it's it's meant more texting. We've tried to do board games or trivia, um, just anything we can do to stay kind of in the rhythms of student life that may not be oversaturated in their current new responsibilities as distance learners. Excellent. Uh, Brahmacharji, uh, how have your community sort of transitioned into the, uh, the, the new sort of way of being? new way of being has been very interesting. Um, much of what Blaine and Molly and uh, Grace have said has been how we've been responding to our students' needs as well. Um, the only thing that we've been doing different was uh, realizing that net Netflix parties were the thing. Um, and you could sit there and watch a movie with everybody in the community that wanted to sign up and do so, and everybody could chat along at the side. So um, that was one thing that we found particularly useful. Um, but in terms of you know, the single biggest takeaway that we have from meditation and yoga practices is that there needs to be 
uh, some kind of regularity to your day and some kind of regularity to how the week and the month works. Um, so we are still having our, um, our devotional gatherings for those from the devotional traditions who worship God. Um, we have that every Sunday as, uh, at the same time that we used to. And we've actually found students pulling in their parents and saying, look how it's done, <laughs> look how it's done. Um, but we also have um, the philosophical meditations for those uh, who belong to traditions that are non-theist. Uh, we focus more on uh, developing the mind and um, helping people understand the difference between intelligence and mind. And that led to a lot of calls for discussion groups. So we now have two uh, separate discussion groups. One, because people who are Hindu are not usually supposed to be believing or uh, spiritual at, at this moment in time. They're just supposed to be culturally aware. Uh, so we have this social, cultural kind of discussion group. And then we have a more spiritual, philosophical kind of discussion group, all of which really take up a lot of time and my challenge I think I found is trying to make what we offer via Zoom or whatever online connection we have different to what they're interfacing with with their classes, with their Netflix, with their other online games and all that kind of thing. Uh, we have to kind of carve out some kind of sacredness through the same screen in which they uh, experience their every day-to-day -day life. So you're moving me into sort of where I, I um, want to spend a little time talking. Um, uh, Molly, what have been the positives out of moving into sort of this online sort of virtual uh, way of uh, gathering ourselves as a community? Well, I think one piece is just the new knowledge uh, and toolkit that's coming with it. I can say for me personally, I've learned a lot of new technologies that I'm now able to use with my students. Um, and also, I think we are trying to more effectively use social media than we've ever done before. And if I'm being totally honest, we were definitely behind the curve already. And like, we needed a little bit of a kick in the pants to like move forward and get with the program and be where we need to be with social media for the age that we're in today. And I think this um, situation is creating the framework in which we are needing to push ourselves, we are needing to move forward. Um, and I think that that will ultimately be a positive payoff that will continue into the future, um, even after, God willing, this is all over. And I think that um, the other positive thing that I would say is that um, I've spoken a few times about how core the relationship piece is for our work. And I also want to acknowledge in that, that sometimes when we are coming from a place of trying to build relationships, with students, if it's students that haven't already been connected with us or don't already um, sort of have pre-existing connection to our community, there might be a little bit of a skepticism that we get of like, oh, are you just trying to get me to go to this program? Like, are you just trying to be an event recruiter? And part of the work that we do is like helping people understand that we are genuinely just invested in them and their success and being in relationship with them. And even if they have a close relationship with a staff person or an intern and literally never come to any sort of formal program like that's fine we we want to still be there for them and still have them as part of our community um and that is a really hard message sometimes to rely to to relay um rather and i think there's an interesting thing about the situation right now where people are almost more able to hear that message they're more able to understand like yeah, like you do just want to check in with me because like there's not even an event that you would be recruiting me to right now. So I think there's um, a certain way that our path has been eased in trying to uh, help help students and others see the, the true centrality of relationships for us. Thank you so much, Blaine. What have been the positives you've experienced so far? Yeah, I mean, just circling back, I totally want to take Molly's idea for the coffee day thing, especially if someone can send me the coffee. If I can get students to buy into that, I'm all in. Um, but to your current Great. question. So, so is the coffee date thing, we also need to have Uber Eats deliver the hot coffee to our houses? I'm, I'm, just, I'm saying I'm open to that. I'm open to that. <laughs> Blaine, you and I will work this out, um, you know, perfect. how we can do the coffee delivery um, moment together. It's Molly, perfect. we'll include you in this since it's your idea. Yes. Um, no, but to the current question, um, I think, you know, to be a little bit candid, I think it's brought into perspective healthier work-life balance for myself and some of our staff team. I think because um, I used to work in church life before campus ministry, 
Um, I worked at a large growing church and we worked many hours a week. And I feel like I'm, I unintentionally brought some of that over into my current team leadership. And uh, students would never describe me as flexible. They usually describe me as rigid or the benevolent dictator, um, keyword benevolent. Um, so I think now that we're kind of distanced from each other in proximity, we've been emphasizing things like exercise, uh, finding a routine that works for you, um, and then also really just um, focusing on a holistic spiritual formation, which we say we did, but I think now we're having to do. So I think that's one of the positives for me and my family, but also the staff team that works with me. Ramachari, what have been the positives for you so far? You mean aside from meeting the wonderful parents that kind of drop in on their kids as, as their... <laughs> Well, that's sort of an interesting way of connecting parents to what's happening on campuses, isn't it? Oh, it was wonderful. I actually had a kid have to chase out their um, their parent from the room, and the parent and them were just having a wonderful argument. It was great. It was so jovial in the way that they were arguing about uh, getting uh, getting off the camera. And of course, uh, you know, they weren't unmuted, so you got to hear the whole thing, the entire uh, gathered community. <laughs> everyone is basically a free comedy show. You always get these people. Uh, that turn up uh, to classes because I'm still teaching. Um, they think that they're clever and they do the top dressing thing and they don't worry about if they're into, you know, pajama bottoms or other stuff. And then obviously their their laptop will slip and then you'd see, aha, you've done what nearly everybody else has done and just come top half dressed. So that's, the, that's been kind of interesting. But on a serious note, it really has, um, as Blaine was saying, it's really brought perspective on many different things. And for us, I think, a lot of perspective was gained in the fact that people really do appreciate the devotional gatherings that we have. People do really appreciate that time and the sacredness of that time um, in a way that I thought that our students were more discussion oriented or relationship oriented. It has turned out that there's been a significant call for we have exactly the same numbers um, online that we had in person, uh, which is astounding considering the kind of numbers that we had. Um, and uh, last week, for example, uh, we had 50 people more. And I was like, where did you guys come from? And it turns out that they had shared the link with their family members and the family members were now joining in as well. Although they did the clever thing and hid their screens. So, you know, Zoom is good for that. <laughs> and Grace, where, where have the positives that you found so far been? So my internet's cutting a little out. Can you guys still hear me? Yes, we can We can hear you. Did okay, you hear great, Grace? great. Yes, yeah. So I, I really just have to kind of echo what everyone else has been saying, Molly, Blaine, Brahmachari. I mean, you know, Molly is saying with like the new technology. I mean, I'm learning how to use broadcasting software, which is never something I would have ever had to learn. Um, you know, and then also like, what Molly said about the students really seeing that we are genuinely interested in in them as as human beings and not just numbers or them as numbers and I think they are seeing that because like all of us we don't have to be we don't have to be working right now and we are because we love the students and um and then what Blaine said kind of like realizing that work-life balance I think has been great for our staff but also for our students I've seen so many students finally taking a deep breath and finally resting and finally reading that book they've been meaning to read and it's amazing I, I went for a walk the other day and there were so many dads out teaching their kids how to ride the bike or how to seed the lawn and and it was amazing you know these you know parents and families I've been able to see like so many families like getting able to to rebond and then like what Brahmachari said, just that appreciation for what devotion is. I've seen so many people appreciate what our liturgy is now that we can't have it and now that we can't gather in a group. And so, yeah, I just I just want to echo what everyone else is saying because I've just seen it all so true for our community as well. So as a parent who is uh, doing some of this family bonding, I will tell you that reseeding the lawn and teaching them to ride a bike is also a survival technique of getting them outside so that they can also exercise. <laughs> but, it, you know, I will admit that that has also been one of the, the, the uh, joys uh, of, of being here and spending time with mine. Um, I want to name and, and want to spend a little time discussing this as well. Um, so in the United Methodist Church, uh, which is the tradition I'm from, um, we are having a great discussion about how we continue our sacramental practices um, and sort of the limitations on what we can do and what we can't do 
um, from a virtual sort of perspective. Consecrating elements from a camera is not considered a valid form of the sacraments for us. And so looking at other ways of gathering a community around um, different mechanisms, Love Feast is one of them in which sort of there are shared prayers, but you know, it isn't seen as um, the sacrament or the Eucharist in the way that it, you know, it is traditionally seen um, with people together in a shared space. Um, so, uh, so Grace, I intend to start with you. What are the challenges um, that you've experienced so far um, sort of gathering the community in this particular way? I don't think she heard me. So Blaine, I'm going to go to you. Blaine, what have been the challenges? Yeah, that was that was to you. I, I'm pointing at the camera. No one can tell who I'm pointing to. Grace, that was to you. Did no, you? No, sorry, my, I, I'm hearing like every other word because my internet connection is a little odd. So I'm just going to ask someone else who's on it to log to log off the internet real quick. But if okay. Blaine could go ahead, that'd be great. And I can. All right, I can no, come Blaine. Back in a second. What are the challenges been? Yeah, I think it's something that um, we've thought about and because of some of my educational background, I mean, no one's laughing right now that I did religious studies and computer science, but it was a joke for many, many years. Who would pair those two together? Um, for us, it's a question of, um, you know, water baptism by immersion, serving the communion elements, sharing those together. And then I think times of concentrated intercession where we kind of lay hands on somebody to pray for them. It, it seems to us that one of the challenges is that although we are considered a low church tradition where we can exercise a lot of creativity, there's not a really way we found to do it that doesn't cheapen that experience. Although Pentecostals aren't really known as being sacramental, in my own spiritual formation, I feel like it's such a beautiful discovery where uh, the spiritual meets the natural or the material. And so we've honestly had to press pause um, on those things. Yes, we still pray together over Zoom, although it's awkward. Uh, no, we are not going to, you know, baptize someone in their tub with the help of their sibling. Um, and communion, we, we have thought, we, we have seen other churches like Life.Church has sent out communion elements to their online parishioners. But for us, we, we did feel like switching the, the medium almost impacted the message. And we wanted to be sensitive um, especially coming from a low church casual tradition, lots of tattoos and beards, uh, that we didn't um, we didn't cheapen the importance of those things in an attempt to continue them. So we're pressed pause on those three elements in our community for the time being and foreseeable future. All right, Molly, we'll go to you, um, and then we'll come back to Grace. What are the challenges? Thank you. So I think there are a number of challenges that are. Um, coming up in the Jewish community more broadly. And I think to a certain extent, some of those broader challenges are not totally reflective um, of the specific challenges that I think some of our students are, are feeling. And, and I'll um, explain what I mean about that a little bit more in the sense that for the Jewish community at large, I think there is a lot of sort of redefining and boundary setting um, going on right now, because as I mentioned earlier at the beginning, there are you know, really a number of uh, ritual and prayer practices that are, uh, that have as a requirement, as a prerequisite to do them, um, uh, there needs to be a certain number of people in the room. Um, and generally within the framework of uh, traditional Jewish life and ritual, there would be no substitute for that. Like we couldn't, um, within a traditional framework, just zoom in together and treat it as if we were in the same room. And part of what's happening within the community is um, some really deep and sometimes really difficult questioning of like, are there boundaries that might be readjusted around that because of the particular time frame that we're in? And this could be as serious, you know, as thinking about if somebody loses a loved one and they would traditionally recite the mourner's Kaddish, a prayer um, that mourners say over the dead while they're in mourning, and it's a prayer that requires a quorum of 10 people to be together to say that prayer, are we going to tell that person, you can't engage in this mourning ritual because we are living in a world where 10 people can't gather together? Or is there a shifting of boundary where maybe for the time being, there would be a change in the way that um, you know, that, that ritual is exercised. So these are really like difficult and painful and challenging questions that are coming up in, in the Jewish community at large. Um, as I also mentioned at the beginning, 
for many of the students that that we work with on campus these sorts of like legalistic or ritual concerns are not really at the at the core necessarily of their jewish identity and jewish practice and jewish uh, connection so the sorts of questions that we might be dealing with more related to um you know as a norm coming from our students are questions around you know the cultural and social connection that they might be expressing and living on campus particularly through their leadership a lot of uh students and a lot of folks within our community one of the one of the most fulfilling avenues of their jewish identity is through the leadership that they exercise within the community um, and right now we have literally dozens and dozens of leadership roles that are in a like questionably functioning status you know for all of these student boards like are they still on the student board is the group doing anything what does that mean um and taking it also in the context that people are feeling overwhelmed stressed they don't necessarily need to take on another responsibility um but what does it mean to still feel connected to this to this community um and like like they have an active um role within within the community when so much of these other pieces are on pause so I think both both of those elements are are really representing challenges right now. Excellent, uh, Grace. Now coming to you, uh, what are the challenges been? Great. So our challenges have kind of been, yeah, I tend to be pretty similar to to Blaine and Molly's. Maybe a little bit more of like a hybrid, but. Our challenge has been that we haven't done we the public has not been able to receive any of our sacraments which is our primary way of connecting with god and it's the primary way that he he comes to us is through is through these sacraments i mean luckily most of the sacraments only require like a priest and one or two other people present in order to be effective um and so you know in the history of our church we've seen you know the sur the survival of our church you know, there have been ordinations done, priesthood ordinations done in Dachau and, you know, like things like that, where like these things can survive. And so the priests are saying mass every day in their own homes. And so what we encourage our students and our communities to do is to watch, watch that, or maybe even they can look up the text of the actual liturgy and pray with it themselves, you know, without the screen, if they so choose. And, um, and you know they can pray with it and then we we call it an act of spiritual communion and so we encourage our students to say like you know lord i can't receive you in our in our eucharist in our communion right now but i ask you to come into my soul as if i were receiving that and so we encourage our students to do that and so that gives them you know and god god works and he he can give those graces wherever he wants and so he can still do that and so it's it's that what matters is that like that genuine um desire to to be with god and to receive god and so that challenge has been really hard because a lot of our students want the liturgy they want they want these things but we've been encouraging them to to make these acts of spiritual communion um another challenge has been for us you know we do reconciliation and um and so a lot of a lot of priests have been doing like drive-through confessionals <laughs> It's, it's hilarious but it's like awesome you drive up in your car and the priest is on the other side of the window you're like totally six feet apart no one's around you no one can hear what you're saying uh, my parents actually just are going to one tonight i think <laughs> and it's just such a creative way of like dealing with this challenge that like we can't be six feet we can't be we have to be six feet apart even though this is such like a sacred secret like people you know people will die to to you know protect what's said in the in the confessional and so like really trying to keep that that sacred has been huge and then yeah another challenge for people i know has been you know people have had marriages scheduled and they've either had to postpone them or i know a couple who said hey you know what we're just going to do our party later we're getting married tomorrow <laughs> and they decided to get married the next day so you know we, we've been working with the challenges that have presented us but it definitely is hard for for a lot of us you know to just not be able to go to our regular our regular devotion and that's that's been really tough but yeah, we've been we've been rolling with it. Um, I think another challenge has just been, you know, not being able to see the students. I I, I was zooming with one of the students earlier today, and I, I just miss them being around. <laughs> just, <laughs> and I know that they miss their community, and so you know, I I think that's just tough too. It's just there's a difference when you're physically with someone versus Zoom. Brahmacharji, uh, briefly, how do you see? You know, what have been the sort of the challenges you you've been facing 
Yeah, um, very quickly, the, uh, the point that Grace just highlighted is very important uh, for us because we operate with spiritual director and seeker. And it is not just the words out of somebody's mouth. It is not just the look on their face. It is everything about how they're positioned, how they're sitting, all of those cues that you would get in the physical presence of that person. So I think that in terms of um, knowledge transmission, there's been a little bit of a hiccup. Another, another part of the hiccup has been something that Molly referred to um, with the first few deaths of Hindu families um, over here in the UK, trying to perform funerals or having memorials that we're supposed to be having at this time, keeping the 13 days vigils that we're supposed to do, um, keeping the 41 days of mourning that we're supposed to do. Those have become very, very difficult. Um, I had been invited long ago to a house blessing where they, the people said their priest is going to be there from home. They've invited him from India. And, you know, I was getting excited to meet this guy as well. And they start the blessing and I'm like, what's going on? They pull out a, comu a computer and the guy's there on Skype chanting away. And I thought, well, that's one way of doing it. Um, and that's basically been the other challenge. How many of these the, of our practices do we try to make uh, available on screen? Um, and retain any of their cogency, any of their sacredness. Um, I was asked to do yoga classes online, uh, doing chanting of the beads online um, with people, and to have somebody saying the word Om, but have it said oh, uh, 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 as you're waiting for their internet to catch up, it just takes away any of the sacredness from that. So um, we've definitely gone to the more information content rather than uh, trying to keep those practices alive. So that's been a learning. And, you know, uh, you brought up some of our future conversations we'll be having in these discussions. Um, one of our last ones is going to be around uh, the question on funerals, funeral rites, and sort of those, and mourning, actually, um, uh, in sort of this time of social distancing. Uh, anyone can jump in here, sort of uh, have just a few more questions. Uh, how do you imagine our religious and spiritual communities are going to be redefined um, in a long lasting way after we're able to return to whatever uh, we understand normal to be. Uh, anyone who wants to jump? Yeah, I think with churches and ministries having more experience and access to great tools for communicating online, from Zoom to Life.Church's free online church platform. I mean, they reported that they went from on their platform 1.1 million people per weekend using it to 4.4 million people using it. It's what caused the crash at YouTube and Facebook two weekends ago with people attending online church services. So I think what will happen is that people will have uh, more of a choice in terms of where they get their content from. And I think that will lead to some fragmentation. Uh, I want to hear this pastor, but this worship band, I want to be involved with this Bible study. And so I think it, it's hard to form someone holistically that's fragmented. I do think that there will be a rush back to what some are calling analog church or in real life church. Um, I think what I'm having to remind myself of as a faith leader is how do I kind of read the signs of what's going on, but not necessarily hitch my wagon to whatever's currently popular in that moment. And that's challenging because there's, I think, low-hanging fruit when you're kind of in front of things. But we're kind of asking the question, what will change for the next academic year? But in five academic years, what will be different? How students engage with theology or spirituality digitally and in real life? So we do hope, um, as Brahmachari said, that there's a, there's a return to a sense of um, meaning and devotion when you're with someone, when there's that full experience of another person. For us, it reflects the incarnate reality of God, but we're trying to figure out what does that look like in terms of our methodologies and skills. Anyone up? Yes, Molly. Um, I'm, I, I agree with a lot of what Blaine said just around like technological restructuring, and I think there will be continuing impact for that. Um, and I'm also thinking about um, the the ways that we as individuals and in our uh, different uh, spiritual and cultural communities might feel really deeply like impacted and and personally affected by the the circumstance in the world that we're in and we're really in it right now but at a certain point in the future um, many of us God willing will be looking back and telling you know folks about what it was like during this experience or what we're what were the insights? What were the personal uh, 
transformations that we had or the things that we were thinking about during this time. Um, and I think that there's actually like a huge potential for personal growth within that. And, and I think there's a huge potential for um, having a very different perspective, both on uh, religious themes and, and also just so much of the gratitude of, of life. And, you know, I'm thinking a lot, my mind is very much on Passover right now. Um, Passover starts a week from today, which is one of the major holidays in the in the Jewish calendar and for a great number of American Jewish families, probably the most significant uh, ritual family moment of the year. And the reality is that Passover and Passover seders are going to look very different for a lot of people this year. Um, there's going to be people doing solo seders or Skyping into a family seder in a different part of the country that normally they would be part of. Um, and that is a really, you know, painful um, thing that represents loss for a lot of folks. And at the same time, I'm thinking, you know, in the story of Exodus and in, in the story of Shemot, we are uh, taught that the Israelites are actually told to shelter in place in their homes before the, the plague of hail rains down. Um, and I think there's like this striking imagery of we're literally being told to shelter in place in our homes as what feels like a plague is hitting the world around us. Like, is there a way that we could actually relate to Passover differently this year and perhaps more deeply than we ever have before? Um, and I hope that there may be elements of, you know, there is there is a spiritual resonance um, or, or relevance to our lives that is new and unprecedented and may be able to also shape who we are after after this is over. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'm going to move on. So one of the things uh, I wanted to sort of name, this is about finding community in disconnected times. Um, I, some of you have mentioned having coffee with people over Zoom. I've watched my three-year-old interact with their class on Zoom. I've never seen him happier. He spent the entire time screaming at the computer screen, even though he was muted, making sure that all of his friends knew what toys he was playing with at any given time. Um, I personally, um, have there's a, a, a bicycling organization I belong to that is creating virtual meetups in which people are riding virtually together and they're opening up chats and, and those sorts of things. Um, as we're exploring community, are there other communities that y'all are connecting with, uh, non-religious, just sort of general community things that you just sort of want to lift up real quick um, as we sort of bring our conversation today to a conclusion? <laughs> and everyone's jumping in at once. On that, how would you recommend um, all of you, um, we're going to take a moment to go through this, and Grace, I know you had something you wanted to bring up, so we're going to get to start with you. How would you recommend anyone connect with community who's looking for it right now? Um, Includes naming your community. <laughs> okay, wait. <laughs> Repeat the question, please. <laughs> how would you recommend, for someone who's looking for a community right now, how would you recommend sure. they do it? And I, anyone who's watching, you know, always you can connect with all of the religious communities you see represented here and our broader K Spiritual Life communities um, by going to the K Spiritual Life Center website, where you'll find links and email addresses for all of our various religious communities and their leaders. Grace, how would you recommend someone connect to community? Yeah, so I would, I would say two things. One, do your research and two, be honest. Like everyone is struggling right now. And so if we're not honest about where we are, and how hard this is and where we're coming from and how much we need this you know community even if it's on zoom then we're not we we, we got to speak up for ourselves we got to say that that this is hard i um i'm also participating in like a young adult thing every week and we've been doing zoom calls and then we divide up into small groups and that's been so good because all of us kind of sat there one time we didn't even talk about the questions that they gave us we just sat there and we're like this is so nice <laughs> we just like looked at the at the screens we're like oh this is so nice to be with everyone and so i think it's very important to to do your research to find out you know what things are going on i know that there are like people doing zumba on zoom and so you know do your zoom zumba or um you know there are people who are doing book clubs on zoom and I'm sure everyone is more social media active than ever. I know for our church, the whole archdiocese has posted resources on their main website, but then also all of the ministries have. And I know it's the same for a lot of like workout communities. Like I know karate studios are doing everything on Zoom now too. And so I think it's important to do your research, but then it's also important to, to shoot the person who's coordinating in an email and be like, hey, I'm struggling, I need this community. 
or even just like saying it to someone, like speaking it up and bringing it to light is what's going to bring healing to that. And that's what's going to give you the community that you need. So those are the two things I would say. Anyone else? I would recommend. <clears throat> Yeah, I think for, for us, I think to kind of continue on that line of thought that, that Grace shared is I think we need to be honest with ourselves about our emotions, which I'll speak. I can't speak for every Protestant or Pentecostal, but I will try. We're not great with our emotions. We typically devalue our personal emotions and overvalue emotions in uh, experiential services or gatherings. So I think reminding ourselves that we are made in the image of God and then how do we kind of flow out of that into connection? I think for myself, my staff, many of our students, social media was a form of disengagement from the physical world around them. Now we're asking them to create a whole new box for things, to use social media as a way to re-engage what was and cannot be. And that's why I like Molly's discussion about the Passover, because there is a loss there that we want to name and talk about. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Brahmacharya ji, uh, what would you say, or Molly, either of you? Yeah, I mean, basically, ditto in Grace and uh, what Blaine said before, um, I think with us, because we're in diaspora and we don't have our spiritual leadership, or at least the type of spiritual leadership or social leadership, depending on what flavor you are, um, present and accessible readily, we've gotten used to, you know, consuming bits and pieces from here and there, bits of YouTube, bits of this, bits of that. And um, I think what the times have allowed us to do is to figure out how we form meaningful and um, holistic communities um, with the people that we're now reconnecting with on social media off of the basis of our own little um, journeys down the rabbit hole, the spiritual rabbit hole of um, YouTubing and um, other things, other uh, means of um, conveying spiritual content. So in that way, I think uh, what our students will be doing at least is uh, to gather together their, their top lists of, you know, spiritual talks or, or songs or uh, discussions or what have you, and sharing that amongst uh, amongst groups. And what, what has tended to happen is that little groups have broken off and formed really close friendships uh, because they see that, oh, wait, this person that we never knew or never knew thought in that way is actually thinking a lot closer to the way I think. So it's been a, a little bit of a boon that way in growing community. Well, any way that you recommend someone finding community? My top recommendation would be send a send a one on one message. Um, I think it's the easiest way to start, and I think it's it takes the least amount of research, um, the least amount of effort probably. When we're in a time where I think many of us, myself included, are feeling like overwhelmed with things that even feel like small tasks, and I think the power of sending you know one message to one person that you know that says. Uh, hey, I could really use a check-in, let's talk. I think that's really powerful and, and can lead to um, a lot of beautiful relationship and community building down the road. That's a great way to sort of segue to our conclusion. That brings this conversation of finding community in disconnected times uh, to conclusion. Uh, join us the same time and the same day next week when this group or some variation of it will, uh, will consider how we express compassion. Molly, that was a great setup express compassion and care while we all remain separated, um, which we've titled Care Without a Hug. Um, reaching out to those that we know one-on-one, -on -one, individually saying when we need a hug or checking to make sure that they didn't, I think becomes really important. So we're gonna have a broader conversation about that next week on how we do that. You'll be able to find links to the upcoming event as well as recording of this conversation on the American University Case Spiritual Life website. I thank my panelists, Grace Haggerty, uh, Reverend Blaine Young, the Venerable Brahmachari Brajvahari Sharan, and Mary, uh, Mary Molly Feldman um, for being a part of this conversation. I'm extremely grateful for the thoughtfulness and talent that each of these companions brings to this endeavor of American University and the Case Spiritual Life Center and, uh, and of our broader mission of, for meaning, purpose, and community here with the American University community. Thank you for all of the attendees who've joined us, and I pray that all who are with us as panelists and participants remain healthy and well. Take care. Thank you very much. Thank you.